You're going to leave New York now. This is a big thing. And you're moving to completely across the country, 3,000 miles away from your parents, your neighborhood, uh, the friends that you have. What prompted the decision to move to Los Angeles? And how did you hope to support yourself once you got here? Well, um, the reality was that I applied to all these colleges after I got out of high school. Mm -hmm. I was only accepted by Los Angeles City College. They said, come on down. Good. That was it. So that, that puts you on the road. And you like pack a bag, do you fly out, do you drive a car, do you no. hitchhike? I didn't know how to drive a car. I'd never been behind That's a right, you're a New Yorker. Correct. We don't have cars, learn how to drive cars in 1963. So good, move to the car capital of the world, that's great. I got in a plane and I came out here in uh, the summer of 63. I didn't know a soul. No. I got off the plane and um, I went to the, the place where the buses showed up. And I asked somebody, um, how do I get to Vermont Avenue? Because I had the address of Los Angeles City College. Hmm. So you take that bus to that place, and then you get on the other bus, and you go to that place, and you'll be on Vermont Avenue. And I got on a bus, and it took me to Vermont Avenue, and I told the driver, uh, wherever the stop is that's closest to LA City College, just tell me, and I'm going to get off there. And he said, fine. Got off the bus, and... Um, I found the nearest motel. It was a travel lodge or you know, just some mo a motel. And I checked in. And then the next day I uh, walked what was two or three blocks to LA City College, it was the summer, and saw what a college looked like. It was very nice. By the way, just before I left New York, I decided I wanted to become a disc jockey. Mm. See, I'd beaten the stutter, Jim. And there were no academic credentials or skills. But when I was growing up, I was listening and watching television and listening to radio. Mm -hmm. TV and radio were my friends. I grew up on David Susskind. Gene Shepard, a radio monologist on WOR Radio, and Jack Parr, the second host of The Tonight Show after Steve Allen. Television and radio became friends of mine during my period of isolation. And it, it seemed like an appealing idea to be able to play records and talk to people on the air. So when I got to L.A. City College and filled out the forms that said, uh, what do you want to study? And I said, broadcasting. And I checked that box. You had to check a few others. I forgot what I checked. But the only classes I ever remember taking at L.A. City College were broadcasting classes. It would turn out that L.A. City College had a fabulous broadcasting department. It was a bungalow in the middle of the campus. Mm -hmm. And there'd be two professors, uh, two teachers. One was a, a former uh, broadcaster who had a voice almost as deep as yours. He was a little older, and he would uh, give us a pontificate about the history of broadcasting and teach you how to work a microphone by cupping your hand behind your ear and speaking that way. He showed you how to do the news, N-U-Z-E. There was also a younger dude who was hired who was trying to teach people how to become disc jockeys, sportscasters. But these two guys were great. The bungalow was fabulous. It was like a little old-fashioned bungalow right in the middle of the campus. And I uh, took it by storm. I took every broadcasting class they could have. I wanted to learn how to become a weatherman, how to become a newsman, how to become a sportscaster, how to become a disc jockey, how to get a third-class engineering license. Uh, how to uh, be a cameraman, how to talk in front of a TV camera, how to talk on uh, radio, how to do interviews. Um, it was fabulous. It was fabulous. Um, 
my recollections of that school and that little broadcasting division, and forgive me the two professors whose names I no longer have, um, that was the ticket to ride. Oh, that's great. So you just yeah. knew it. It just hit um, you. Jim, the, the, you know, there, there are these uh, epiphanies. There are these moments where you suddenly feel like you were at home. Yeah. It's tantamount to falling in love when you find the woman that you are uh, predestined to spend your life with. You take a deep breath, you thank the gods, and you recognize that there is a place in your heart that's been tapped, and you are at home. You are safe and you are covered. So, um, I studied broadcasting. I, I walked into it uh, with an open mind, and I devoured the classes. I, I moved from that little motel and found a, a place to live. Um, on Harvard Avenue, 1626 North Harvard. Mm -hmm. It was between Sunset Boulevard and Hollywood Boulevard, about three blocks east of Western Avenue. I'm not sure how much it cost, but I think it was $75 a month. It was uh, one room with a couch that you opened up and turned into a bed. It had a, a little mini bar and a hot plate and a stand-up shower. And it was heaven. It was my yeah. I, I, first time I ever lived by myself. I had my own key. I could come and go whenever I wanted. If I wanted to have somebody come by and play the music really loud, I could. It was not a dump. It was not a dive. It was home. And I would stay there, I think, for two years. And I would wake up every morning and I would uh, walk uh, half a block up to Hollywood Boulevard, get on the bus, uh, take it to Vermont, change to another bus, take it down to Melrose, to LA City College. Uh, they had all these machines where you put in a quarter and you can get your breakfast, which was usually for me a donut and um, uh, an orange juice. Right. Had the donut and orange juice, went to uh, the bungalow, and you started to learn broadcasting. I did. And I remember the, uh, during that first week when there were 30 people in the class, we had goals to fulfill. I still was a little self-conscious about the residual effects of the stutter, but the professor uh, told me that that was going to go away really fast, that he had a way of eliminating stuttering. He said, you've got a more serious problem. He said, it's that accent. And of course, I was unaware of the fact that I had an accent because I had always lived in New York, where they talk like that. <laughs> so, where's the problem with stutter? You know, problem with stutter. The problem was that when I was eating, I'm in school, I'm talking about being on the radio, and a guy says, look, uh, you're working at, you know, where you're talking? You can't talk that way in the radio. <laughs> it's, well, how else do other people talk? Yeah. It's the way people talk. People talk, they listen to on the radio. So I began um, uh, at night when I took the bus back to the apartment to lay down on the floor, take a 30 pound typewriter, put it on my diaphragm, oh, wow. and do breathing exercises and speak as the typewriter is pushing in on my diaphragm. And I'm pushing out with my breath and learning to speak a little louder and slower and clearer. And I'm being conscious of the fact that I'm saying water instead of water. Mm -hmm. That process for months, many months, resulted in the way I speak now. People who meet me these days and who have met me most of my life you know, the first question they ask me is uh, if I'm Canadian. Really? They think this sound, the way I speak, is a Canadian sound. Um, at that time, in the, in the early 60s, the second question they asked me is if I was gay. Really? Wow. 
because there was something about this amalgamation of getting past the stutter and getting past the New York accent to wind up with the way I talk, mm -hmm. which some people view as being very affected and it turns a lot of folks off. I know that. Uh, it's, it was the result of getting rid of uh, two of my verbal nemesis. Um, I'm neither Canadian nor gay, but this is the voice that I was uh, left with. But you can speak with a 30-pound typewriter on your diaphragm, which not everybody can claim to do. Well, I could in 1963. I don't know how. And by the way, try and find a typewriter. Yeah. You know, I never knew that story before. It's a fascinating story. I never knew that, that you had to actually go through that. To, and I always kind of wondered about the New York accent, but I didn't realize that was the methodology. Of I have it. some tapes in the archives that you just might hear creeping through right now. I have a feeling when this thing appears, wherever it's going to appear, of me, um, of tapes I saved from L.A. City College. When I still had the residual stutter, and when I had the hardcore New York accent, and you'll hear me doing the exercise, and you'll hear me being the worst sportscaster you ever heard in your life. Because I, I studied all those aspects of broadcasting, and of course, I was a failure at all of them. I mean, I just couldn't pull any of it off, except for one thing, one class where I excelled, and that was in interviewing people. 